Good evening, I'm Ernie Manus. Tonight we invite you into a conversation on race. On June 7, 1998, the dismembered body of James Byrd Jr. was found in Jasper, Texas, the victim of a heinous hate crime. Our community, our nation, our world was shocked and saddened by this violent act. And racial wounds, thought by many to be healed, were reopened. Ten years later, on June 3, 2008, an African-American, Barack Obama, became the presumptive Democratic nominee for President of the United States. That got us thinking. Have we really come this far? Where are we as a nation, a state, as a community, when it comes to race? Could the same thing that happened to Mr. Byrd 10 years ago happen again today? To navigate these issues, we've brought together a group of community leaders, scholars, and activists, and invited them to join in a frank and open discussion on race. Our panel consists of Dr. Laura Oren from the University of Houston Law Center, mediator, Judge Josefina Rendon, the Reverend William A. Lawson, Houston Chronicle Metro Editor, Tony Fremantle, Houston NAACP President, Carol Mims Galloway, Houston Police Chief, Harold Hurt, Rice University's Stephen Kleinberg, and Cherry Stenwender from the Center for Healing of Racism. I want to thank you all for being here and let the discussion begin. My first question would go to Reverend Lawson. As an accomplished man who was involved so much in the civil rights movements of the 60s and up through the years, when you heard about James Byrd's death, personally, how did that affect you? Well, that both shocked and saddened me. I had been part of the civil rights movement, and I watched the nation presumably advance uh, from the time when everything was segregated, as Ms. Galloway says, uh, to the time when the nation was now willing to accept a, a civil rights bill. And I think that, that most of us expected that we had made some major changes. So the death of James Byrd, and especially in that, in that horrible way, uh, did sadden us, and it shocked me. Yeah. Chief Hurt, as an accomplished African-American man in today's society, to hear that something like that can go on, what does it do personally to you? When you read about something like that, how does it make you feel? Well, number one, it took something like that to bring us to where we are today, to have this conversation. But what I think of mostly is what happened on a day-to-day -day basis as people try to be successful in society, that is minorities, individuals, and the setbacks that they still face as far as look at education, uh, medical uh, uh, services, uh, ability to afford, you know, other things in the community as far as housing and quality of life issues. And there are still undoubtedly, as you all know, and we all know, there are some people have not been allowed to come to the table as of yet. And so to talk about the homicide that occurred, yes, that's awful. But there are some things that's happening day to day in this country that some of us still feel very much anger and resentment because people are still not allowed to take advantage of all America have to offer. But then what do you do with that anger, with that resentment, so that it doesn't explode out, but that you get some kind of handle on it? I think most of us, we focus on how do we and our families be successful. Mm -hmm. We dig in as far as the schools, education, and our jobs. We do the very best we can because I remember talking to a group of young officers and they said, well, Chief, how did you manage to get promoted uh, through the organization so fast? And because I was fortunate enough when I started my career, I got, after I made sergeant, I got promoted about every three years. I told them I went to work every day like I did not, I would not be afforded a second chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they, you know, it's very yes, interesting sure. because uh, there was one sentence he said, Chief Hurt said, we all know, and that's the problem. We don't all know. There are still too many people within this country that think we fixed it mm -hmm. in the 60s mm -hmm. yes. and that uh, we are colorblind society now. Yeah. And something else is that, oh, well, I'm training my children not to see color, you know, that just to see human beings. And you see, what, is, what has happened is why it shocked us so much because we don't all know. I was just conducting a workshop two days ago, and in that workshop, I'm telling the people that I get followed around when I'm out shopping as if I'm only there to steal. And the woman couldn't believe that. 
And then when she began to believe it, she said, I didn't know that women of color would be followed around in a store as if they were stealing something. Yeah. So because we haven't had the conversation, we don't all know. Dr. Kleinberg, from all of the research you've done, are we really changing as a society or are the feelings just being put down undercover in a sense? Uh, both. We are clearly changing as a society in, in ways that are going to be enormously powerful and central as we build this new multi-ethnic world in the 21st century. But our surveys show this striking difference in the, what the world looks like if you have black skin and if you've got white skin. It's exactly what both of you are saying, that, that the majority of Anglos believe firmly that Thank goodness, we used to be a racist society, now we're colorblind, and, and <laughs> ask identical questions. For example, a question we asked uh, uh, right after the Katrina thing. We said that, uh, as you know, most of the victims of the Katrina hurricane were African Americans. If instead they had been white Americans, do you think the government would have responded more quickly, less quickly, or would that not have made any difference? 78% of African Americans said the government would have responded more quickly. 76% of all Anglos said it would have made no difference. Just striking. And, and we live in a, in a city that is still very segregated, very separate, and so opportunities like this to really honestly talk to each other about, about our experiences and to recognize the, the, the fact that we've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go is, I think, enormously important to go forward. Uh, uh, let me go over to the Can judge. Interject, you know, Sherry mentioned the fact about being followed you know, as an African-American woman, and actually several years ago, and I think it was out of D.C., uh, there was a, uh, a, a store that kept catching this one uh, black uh, person uh, going through the store, and they knew that uh, there, there was a lot of stuff missing, but they could never catch the camera on, on this one person. And then finally they realized that they were acting together. And while everybody was looking at the African-American shopper, the, the, the white accomplice was the one stealing uh, all the stuff. And I, I thought that was a wonderful story. Uh, uh, to tell, you know, when I, when I do my training, so. <laughs> Dr. Arn, how do we get past, though, these feelings, these thoughts? We talk about this, in a sense, broken understanding of reality in some ways. Is there a way to truly merge that? Well, my hang-up is that you think about history a little bit, um, that you don't, I don't even like this colorblind idea, because, um, that's pretending that what's real isn't real. It's like saying, and the court has been doing that recently. Somehow it's all over, it's finished, you know, we had a reconstruction, it's over with, we had a civil rights movement, it's over with, and we don't seem to care about what really is happening as opposed to sort of giving lip service to this colorblind idea. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer that we talk about what it really means um, to be a multiracial society economically. Um, and also I have to stick this in because gender has a lot to do with it. Being a woman of color is not the same thing as being a man of color in a lot of different ways. Being uh, an Anglo woman is not the same thing as being an Anglo man. And so that part has to be included um, if we can really figure out how race matters and I would add how gender matters. Right. Tony, you grew up in South <laughs> Africa. How do you see this topic? When we talk about a colorblind society and the lip service we give to it, what's your reality in all of this? Um, I don't think there's anything such as color blindness. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, when we look at each other, we see differences in color. Um, you know, I remember interviewing Desmond Tutu after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings and asking him what, what his biggest disappointment was about it. You know, we talked a lot about the accomplishments of that, of that process of, of, of reconciliation. But his biggest disappointment was that um, white people hadn't participated in it. And I think this goes to what we've been talking about. This, this is a deep denial that, that white people have anything to do with racism. You know, whereas, in fact, it's, it's, it's there and huge. Um, so you know, I think that, that you know, growing up in South Africa as a white person under apartheid was, was was you know quite an experience because you saw official 
sanctioned racism at work and what it can do. Um, and it wasn't even considered racism. It was legal. Mm-hmm. You know, it, so the, the, but the denial now, after the, the switch, is, is quite outsta- uh, you know, outstanding. I mean, it's, it's, the, the white South Africans really still deny right. their role in, in apartheid um, and that racism exists there. Reverend Lawson, what should we be doing then? What should be our, our goal? If it's not to create a colorblind society, if that's kind of giving lip service to the whole thing, what really are we striving for? I think, first of all, we do need, need to recognize that, that, that not all of us know, and, and we, we do need to have discussions like this. I think that it is necessary for us to look at the ugly realism. Chief Short mentioned speaking uh, to, to somebody. He was in my class. I have a class on this campus uh, that deals with the overpopulation of jails and prisons with, with minority males. Uh, black and, and Hispanic, and and so we still have some very ugly realities, and I think that that the only way to deal with those realities is to start with with conversing about them and 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 to make it uh, realized that that we are not really colorblind. When you say though the overpopulation of minorities in jails, there is a large segment of our audience that's watching right now who would believe that is because they cause more crime. They are the problem. That's why they're in jail. What do you say to that, Ms. Galloway? Uh, I would say that is not so. What it is with the justice system, it seems like the African, young African-American males, their punishment is a plea bargain where you do go to jail because you don't have the means and the finance to get a good lawyer. So therefore, they feel a mozo versus an Anglo. And just from an experience of myself here recently, what I see uh, in our society today is that people of Anglo descendant don't even realize when they're being racist. Uh, this just happened to me recently, I guess uh, about the last two months ago. Just to sh- show you, when persons are raised during the segregated area, we are the people who can identify races immediately because we have lived through it and experienced it. But the younger African Americans, they cannot identify because they have not really lived through it like we did. And I was on the airplane, me and my granddaughter, and I was, uh, and we were sitting approximately about in the eighth row. I told my grandbaby, I said, baby, all in the front of us is Anglo. The steward, the flight attendant, would start on the right to ask you what you want. And, and they would take care of everybody to the right of the, the row, and then they would go to the left. When we were sitting on the right of the row, when the flight attendant got to our row, Anglos were sitting on the other side, uh, uh, on the left side. She went to them first, got them served, and then come to us. And so, see, right then it showed that she got off of her pattern to uh, go to them, another form of racism that is hidden. See, racism is hidden, and some people don't even know that they are being discriminatory. Well, let me against ask you this, a, to take it away from the actual incident and go into how you feel so that the audience understands, what does that do to you? When you're sitting there with your granddaughter and this happens, how do you feel as a person? I, I feel less than a person because the flight attendant did not respect me, uh, us on the right side where she began her servant to, to go to the left side looking at us and saw that we was a black, it made me feel saddened in today and know that was another form of hidden racism. What do you say to your granddaughter in a moment I, like that? I, when I'd already prepped her. I, mm-hmm. I had prepped her because I knew this was going to happen because it happened to me before on flights. I said, baby, watch. I said, see, they got the young gentleman, Anglo, sitting over there and the, the young lady. I said, I bet you she's going to ask them what they want first. And so I say, that is a form of racism. Watch what's going to happen. I mean, she was up four or five rows before she even got to us, but I'd already yeah. overlooked the plane and saw who was at the front behind and where we were, and I'm sure this is exactly what happened. But see, these are little things like this. This is happening every day right. in yeah. African-Americans' life. I'm seeing. Okay. Do, they're trying to pull me over to this side. Uh, <laughs> I'll start with Well, I just want to say one of the things that's so important about that that incident is that that stewardess had no idea that she was doing it. It was totally unconscious. It was not a deliberate act, and therefore 
If you had confronted her with it, she would have been just, what do you mean, crazy? I'm not racist. Do I'm you in, really? No. Let, let me interject uh, here. Uh, 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 okay, you want to interject? I'll let you do it, Chief. I, I think she did know. She's she number know. one. I think she Thank did you. know exactly yeah. because that's what she experienced on a day to day basis. That's right. Now, the other part of it is I would have mm. never, ever, ever, ever let ever. them or anyone says make me feel less than. That's mm-hmm. their problem. They're mm-hmm. dealing with she. You're sitting there. You see that they have gone to the white people first, all the way along. They get to you and they change their pattern. It doesn't bother you, even in some degree, that you think even a sadness for where we are as a nation that no, this would happen. That's her problem. It's not my problem. That's her problem. She's living with that. Look at all the energy she expended to change her route. <laughs> <laughs> so and, work okay. for her. And the thing that, <laughs> but that that's her problem to deal with in that you know because. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that's the issue is and why it continues to exist when we react to those and says, oh, gosh, you know, we're being beaten down. But you stand up there and says, you know, I'm doing nothing wrong. I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm not doing anything that's, that's not Christian. I'm living a good life. If a person wanted to practice that, they have that burden to bear. Okay. Uh, wait one second. I want to get over here, Dr. Orange. I'm, I'm going to say that um, race is my problem, too. It's not just just the chief's problem or a person of color's problem. Explain what you mean by that. Um, because I have to live in a society where people are poor, um, which means that our health care system stinks mm-hmm. and that affects every single one of us who lives in this society. Um, so that maybe I'm not the subject of that kind of insult, but the, the priorities of the society I live in are messed up because of race, mm-hmm. and I am the subject of that. That really does affect me personally. But we do, and I hate to use this term, get a pass. We do have it easier walking through life than... And maybe as a woman, it's different. I, I mean, I'm I'm well, checking off white male woman, on my forms. I mean, as a woman, it is different. Not maybe me, but for um, single women who are taking care of kids um, and who have crappy jobs with no health insurance, yeah, it is different. But well, the way I see it is like it's like race poisons the well. Um, you know, for all of us. And it isn't just a question of being insulted or not being insulted. It's a question of those young men in jail when they could be out here doing something in society. That costs money if you want to make be crude about it. Cherry, I'll get you one second. I <laughs> promised you over here I'll get to you first. Right. Well, uh, piggyback on uh, what uh, Chief Hurd said. Uh, it it did make it, it made me feel less of a person because it was saddened to me mm-hmm. that people in today's society still that 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 race is still an issue. It's not it, it's not where people just look at you as a person, and so this is the reason why. And for my granddaughter to have to experience these things, but I just want her to be able to identify when someone is discriminating against her because of her race. So this is the reason we need to talk about it because the other culture people they don't know when they do something that it's a reflection on discriminating against that particular race of people. And this happens in the stores. It happens every day. Uh, Anglo can come up to the county. You were standing there first. They'll reach over there. And me? Now, I'm the type of person. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to say, hey, hey, honey, I'm sorry. I was here first, okay? You got to get to the back. You know, because you have to do this in order to make them aware. Because that's what I'm saying. You got to talk about Bring out little Pacific issues so people can understand. And that way they can begin to think and say, oh, you know, when I didn't realize, you know, when that's what I was, I was being a racist. So, therefore, I'm not going to do that when I meet another African American. I would do such and such. And if we don't start talking about this and identify all these underlying discriminating tactics that Anglos use against African America, we're not going to ever bring it to the surface in order to make a change. Promise Ms. Steinwender first. <laughs> For me, I feel very sad. I feel very sad, and at the same time, I feel angry. Right. Because why is it we have to 
prepare our children mm -hmm. by telling them. You see, before the uh, airline steward got to her, she'd already told her daughter, her granddaughter, what to expect. Mm -hmm. Why is it that in 2008 we still have to prepare our black and brown children and I want to say black and brown mm -hmm. I want to throw Latinos and Latinas in the mix because here's the little child her mother brought her to my house because her mother wanted me to talk to her little Latin girl and she's about six years old long brownish black hair and black eyes and she said Miss Cherry in a very sad look the children wouldn't play with me. And I said, the children wouldn't play with you. Why not? Because they were playing prince and princess. And they don't have no prince and princess that look like me. So they wouldn't play with her. See, this is a six-year-old child. When I look at my friend, who I call my brother, last name, Galvan, Mexican-American, and he's talking to me. And they went to Washington on some big freedom ride. And when they got off the bus, a bus load of Latin men, the people saw them coming. And they locked the doors and wouldn't let them into the grocery store to shop. They locked the door. You see, we have to have a conversation that's totally different. And that saddens me. But I want to talk, the last thing about the feelings. When you, when it say the song says the first cut, you know what it hurts the worst. But you see, for us, it's everyday little cuts, and you keep getting cut over and over again. And then to be able to say that, oh no, I don't feel that. I don't feel anything. No, it hurts, mm -hmm. and it hurts deep. But we still have to tell our children to prepare them. Mm -hmm. There was a list of questions that we had sent to all of you ahead of time. And just as preparation, we sent this to some of our viewers to respond to. And the ones that came back from the African American viewers, I sat at my desk and started to read them. And I started to get actually weepy eyed. And, and the reason why, I don't think me as my person had ever thought about what you actually experience, what different mm -hmm. ethnic right. groups experience. We tend to think we know it. But that's why I keep coming back to the feeling part. Mm -hmm. I think we forget that not is it just we lock a door, we turn away, whomever, but there's a feeling that ends up resulting in that and that you are ripping at the fabric of another culture of people. And I promise the judge first, and then I'll get to you, Chief. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that you say that about the feeling and, and that uh, it's not just a, a, a black problem, but, but a minority problem in general. It's, I remember a few years ago when this lady, an older lady, told me, uh, uh, you don't look Latina, you're so nice and you have such nice manners. And so, <laughs> and, and you know, I was already an adult, so I, I recognized her ignorance, and I said, thank you, because she was trying to be nice in her own ignorance. But now I imagine a five-year-old getting that message, uh, and I mean, it, it, it is a, something that, that remains in your psyche and, and will remain forever, no matter how accomplished, mm -hmm. uh, it stays there. And, and, and in that uh, note, I, I think there's a difference between, say, um, African Americans, Latinos who were born out of, outside of the United States as opposed to those who were uh, raised here, because they have experienced much more of that racism. If you see, uh, I'm, I'm from, the, from one of the islands, uh, Puerto Rico, and if you see uh, people from Jamaica, for example, Puerto Rico, people who were not raised within here, they don't seem to have that, that hurt psyche in a sense uh, that I see in, in, in many, uh, I'm married to a Mexican American, that I see in many Mexican Americans and many um, African Americans who were raised here, so. Uh, I promised the chief I would go to him next. I would go back. Someone mentioned the fact that they don't realize they're doing it or is unconscious. You don't unconsciously drive your car. You don't unconsciously <laughs> go about your daily chore doing your work or uh, mm -hmm. anything that where your life may be at risk of somebody else. So I, I guess I have to disagree with the fact that people don't realize or they're ignorant mm -hmm. about the fact and uh, their actions are unconscious. Mm 
Yeah. I, I, I want to throw another that. thing into this conversation, and then, then I'll go. I guess yes, I'm losing track of where I'm going there and then over there. But the fact I bring in President, or President, uh, nominee Barack Obama, excuse me on that one, and the comment, like what you said, when they were referring to him as well mannered, like that was something we need to point out about him. And I, I want to get into all of that too in a second, but I promised first I go, Dr. Ord. Well, I'm trying to figure out how you get past um, this. Um, disconnect between per people's perceptions because that's really clearly there it's there in any measurable way that I'm sure um, Dr. Kleinberg has has come up with um, and it's been there in my classroom like um, my students which it's still it's still a predominantly Anglo classroom in the law school although there's a, um, a growing minority uh, population, particularly of Asian Americans, actually. Um, and there, there is this disconnect between the Anglos, as I said before, who think it's over, it's finished, it's done with, and then they feel, and a lot of our students are first generation, they didn't have generation after generation of privilege. They're working their way through college, they're working their way through law school, and they don't see why they owe anybody. That's the way they see it, mm -hmm. like, that, like they're being asked like they owe somebody something. And um, when they think it's all done and it's in the past. And that's somehow there's something wrong with that picture of of posing it that way well, and that was, I'd like to know what we could say to our white children and grandchildren that would make people not see it just this way. Right. That was part of the impetus for us wanting to do this show too is the fact that when you have Barack Obama in the position he's in and we think everything is at peace, if I remember correctly right before the James Byrd incident happened we were at another point where we thought Everything's okay. We just weathered, I guess, the Rodney King and all of that, but there was a feeling we were somewhat of a healed nation, and you see this happen, and it reminds us all, no, there's a lot still going on that still needs to be talked about. I promised the Reverend I would go to him first. We have talked about racism as a sickness, and it certainly is a sickness. Uh, as a preacher, my job is to say that there is hope. And right now, I can see a kind of conflict, a kind of contradiction. Obviously, the young men... Uh, who who killed James Byrd were sick, no question about it. But at the same time, there is a kind of determination that causes people who at the who are at the bottom of the barrel to rise. Uh, when I first came to Houston, I worked at Texas Southern University, and one of the students there had come out of Houston's Fifth Ward. Uh, she was the daughter of, of of a poor preacher, and 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 she would not, uh, by any means, have been thought of it as somebody who could be successful. But she was so determined until she took uh, the seat that, uh, that, right, that right now Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee holds. And, 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 and we're sorry that, that Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee is not here. But that young woman who came out of poverty and who was just determined to make it was Barbara Jordan. That's one thing that I would say. The second thing that I would say is uh, that the contradiction is Somebody, is, somebody has mentioned Barack Obama, uh, is that here is a man, obviously a black man, uh, the, the, the child of, of, of an African and, and a white Kansas woman uh, who, who, has, who has now been, been virtually made uh, a, 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 a Democratic nominee. And he was voted that way in states like Iowa, which, which have very few blacks in it, and Utah, which have very few blacks in it. And when the, the primaries were held in Houston, there was an effort to keep African Americans from voting. They would, they would change the places of the primaries. And yet, we, we poured into those places. We were, we, we, we were determined to vote. And now, there is a nation that, that seems willing to accept whoever you vote for, uh, uh, Obama or, or McCain, that seems willing to accept the possibilities of an African-American president. So you got James Byrd, who's killed 10 years ago, and Barack Obama, who is now a, a, a Democratic nominee, and very possibly uh, a, 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 the, the president. 
And you've got somebody like Barbara Jordan, who had to, who had to drink out of the colored uh, water fountain. Yeah. So, so I think that there is hope, and, and we can see it in, in spite of the real ugliness of a sick racism.